Hello, my name is Keenan, and welcome to the inaugural episode of roughly a podcast, roughly just kind of a creative way to for me to share what I know about biology as a cancer scientist. I want to call it For Whom the Cell Tolls. I'm not exactly like a huge fan of Hemingway, but it really fit, so we're going to run with it. Joining me today is my small Pomeranian, Scout. She's nonverbal, as most dogs are, and will contribute possibly nothing to the audio, but she's cute and good-looking and fun, and it gives me a break if I need to uh, give her attention or something. So, in any case, uh, this inaugural episode's going to explore a few things that I e either have an expertise in or have a very strong interest in, and the first of those is cancer itself. I'm a cancer scientist by training. I study what in the body leads to cancer, how we treat it, and how we can prevent it from coming back, for example. So cancer brings up so much more about what we are as humans because it, inv it, it evokes so much more about life and death, which I think are the two key things that you know, can really define us as humans. The main themes that I do want to go over today are, I think I might have said this already, cancer, life, and death. We're going to focus on life, though, and I'm also going to have to kind of intro out a few philosophical issues that scientists sometimes deal with and, you know, how I kind of wrestle with those. But ultimately, this, um, you know, this these sessions, they're meant for to help people kind of go through the stories as I see them, but you're meant to make your own message of the story as well. So don't ever feel as though, like, if I have an idea, that's how it is, you know. So what I am, I'm a cancer scientist. I work at a famous hospital in Minnesota. I perform research where, you know, I try and take DNA and I see who's going to fail certain therapies and who's going to do better. And a lot of the times, some of the, you know, what the data gives me are these, you know, these amazing answers and we start, you know, uncovering all kinds of new things because of what we can see in the patients. And as a scientist, a lot of the times when I first started, things were very bare to me. I think I started science because I was interested and I liked to talk about it, explain it maybe. A lot of that changed when I had a family member come down with a form of cancer that is very difficult to treat. And I, for the first time, <clears throat> Kind of saw what it's like you know to hold that fear in your heart and not to to not know and part of the reason it's hard is because there are certain things about this disease that i do know that make it more haunting and make it more scary um you know i know how it is now you know what it must feel like getting uh just even a checkup diagnosis to see if it's come back from the therapy the example I've always made is akin to the soldiers that landed on D-Day. When that the landing craft made landing and that door opened, you didn't know if you were going to get shot immediately, after, or not at all. But it's terrifying knowing that the doctor's going to walk back in that room with the results every six months, every three months, whatever, and things could completely change. So I want to bring you know, kind of how I've evolved on cancer. I want to bring that story to people out there that maybe are suffering from this disease, are trying to, to understand it on a more human level. And obviously I'm going to have shortcomings. There are going to be things that I'm going to fail to get across. Just like I do when I'm teaching, for example, even in microbiology, sometimes I will forget to say things or I will forget to clarify things. And since this isn't a lecture, nobody's going to ask questions. Um, you know, maybe I'll add something at the end of episodes or at the beginning of new episodes. But essentially, there's so much amazing content out there. I want to share what I can. And I've been building this, you know, you know, I've been learning all these stories from amazing minds and, you know, from some of my own experiences. But a lot of what I'll share in these episodes are usually, and it's not always going to be about cancer or philosophy, things like that. You know, I want to go over what killed the dinosaurs. I want to go over disease ecology. I want to go over how evolution you know, how we see this process in cancer and in HIV, in all these bad things, but also in all these good things and how that process impacts us every day. So part of the thing that I kind of introed is that I do want to share things about philosophy, culture, politics, while also meshing the themes of biology and life itself. But for this intro recording, and I think it should only be a few minutes, um, 
I really want to go over just what biology is, and that is the study of life. And this is such a funny thing, and I share this with my classes. It's very hard to define life. You know, we've been studying biology. There are tons of biology majors, professors, every which way. But defining life is a very, very difficult thing. So let's go over some basic tenets. We're alive. We can constitute a living thing. You right now listening to this, you are listening, you are conscious, you are, you know, you can make decisions. Ultimately, and again, I'm going to start this all out with my idea. I see life as survival. And survival isn't just the individual, the survival is the lineage, the offspring. So to me, and how I'm going to frame this, is that life is survival. And that's, that's not it, obviously. So I usually do word walls with my students on this, and it's amazing to see, you know, what people put up. One, one student once actually put up, uh, humans are just lucky. We're not superior. No life is superior. It's lucky. And honestly, I wasn't going to discount them. So again, like I said, formulate your own ideas, reflect on them. That's kind of the point of these stories. But starting with life, let's go down to the basic level. We are made of these chemical collections called cells. And they're usually in like a little circular shape. You've seen them. And they are independent. We see that in bacteria. Bacteria are actually cells, just one cell that are about 10 times smaller than our individual cells that, you know, build up on themselves to make us a big human being. Bacteria can live and survive and reproduce, metabolize things. They meet all the core tenets of what life is. You know, essentially they are gonna survive and make it. So life has a, has certain minimum tenets. And this is where, you know, viruses will come up and you could make the argument viruses are alive because their DNA is changing theoretically and they are, you know, for better, you know, it's hard to say that they are metabolizing anything because what viruses do is go in and kind of hijack cells and use them to eat, basically. But defining life's tough because then you're kind of within the bounds that we just stated. So we are all the way down to bacteria. Those are alive. All the way up to us. We're alive. So this intro episode isn't going to go into kind of the tenets that I've explored as what life is, because then you start getting into the idea of is life consciousness, you know, because if you look at bacteria or pond scum organisms, they're basically just following small chemical signals that say, you know, food is over here. Something big just touched you, run away from it, it could eat you. To a degree, are we following those same signals? And this is where psychology comes in, where I'm going to lose a lot of expertise, if not all of it. Um, and, you know, psychology and biology are a very important thing. But again, that's almost a human thing. And that's what brings me to a question that I usually hit my students with very quickly. After I ask them kind of the questions I've just asked you, you know, what's your definition of life? I want you to kind of turn that on its head and think about human life. Think about us versus everything else. <clears throat> so if I'm cleaning something with a Clorox wipe and I wipe it away, I just ended millions of bacterial lives. They're gone. They're erased. Cells burst into pieces because of the chemicals. Completely gone. If I eat food today, then, you know, if I eat meat today, a chicken had to die. Somebody had to kill that and, and end that life. What I'm going to ask you on the philosophical level, and this is where the definition gets difficult, and you can always, you know, you can always Google the definition and it's going to tell you like metabolizing, passing on, heredity, blah, blah, blah. But that's why I'm asking this question is we don't have the concrete definition. And I think where that really sticks is human life versus all other life. You would be tempted to ask the question, is a human life more quote unquote valuable than another life? I think that's a question that you're never going to be able to find an objective or like a, a single moral answer to. I think though, that if you take a look at what makes humans special versus all other life, I think that you do find something. And this is as a scientist, what connects me to disciplines outside of science and, and biology. I believe that human life is a special thing and that we are different 
than all other life. I don't want to say superior because I think that obviously, you know, crosses some, you know, that, that invites a little more debate. I'm not going to say superior. We have one thing that all life does not have, all other life, and that is the ability to understand the abstract. We can look at a piece of art, listen to a Nirvana song, um, you know, read Dostoevsky, and we will come to different conclusions based on different people. You know, different people's experiences will shape that abstract conclusion. Sometimes experience won't shape it. It's simply something says something to somebody that it cannot say to somebody else. We have the ability to see past the objective tangible things that, you know, even other advanced mammal species like otters, um, chimpanzees, they use tools to accomplish means. The fact that we can see into art in the humanities and we can digest that, I think that's something special. And I think that's worth, you know, really being thankful for and really appreciating. And I think it was, I don't know if it was Nietzsche, somebody, I can't remember, talks also about history and how humans are so special because we, we still have instincts as organisms, but instead of passing those on, what we can pass on is knowledge. We can build every generation on what the previous thousand or hundred generations did before. And that is what makes us special, that and cooperation. And I'll cover that in another episode, is that cooperation, not intelligence, is really what made humans, you know, essentially take over the planet. Um... Let's see, the dog is sleeping, so I can't buy time to give her attention. I would waken her, and that would make her quite angry. Um, let's see. I think for the intro episode, that kind of sets things up. This is going to be something where I'm going to introduce stories and questions, and really, I'm not going to give you answers to them. It's not the job of scientists, and I think too many scientists go in that direction of saying, I'm right. My answer is right. Yours is wrong. That's it. So one of the things that I'll stress is that I want you to also come up with your best definition of what truth is. Is truth something absolute? Are there certain truths that are morally absolute, objectively absolute, you know, that's just the right thing or the wrong thing, for example, or is truth relative? There was a book that I read that kind of went over truth as people will see certain truths. And I talked about with this, with the abstract, people will see certain truths at certain times that they won't see them again or the truth can be fluid it can change we can add evidence we can take away you know false evidence or are there absolute things that simply are or are not so the example of relativism was a stream as you watch a stream flow while it looks similar five minutes or a day later it's technically a different stream you're watching different water come past so even as much as some truths may not change, you really have to appreciate that things are always changing. Um, I probably won't have, offer up my my two cents quite yet. I'll let the any listeners out there think about that on their own. And um, this is also a solo podcast, um, but uh, if I ever get to the point where I publish these, I'll ask for questions, input, things like that. You know, anything you want to cover, I can try and go over. But ultimately, I'll kind of just record like I said, some of the stories of biology that I think are exciting and I think are worth going over. In the meantime, uh, good luck and take care of yourselves. I hope you'll join us next time. All right. Say bye, Scout. No, she's, she's not going to say goodbye. All right. Have a good night, everybody. See ya.